Welcome to the Scientist Lab Talk, a special edition podcast produced by the Scientist Creative Services team, where we explore topics at the leading edge of innovative research. This episode is brought to you by Keystone Symposia. Don't miss their upcoming virtual e-symposium on myeloid cells and innate immunity in solid tumors from September 21st through September 23rd, 2020. One of the e-symposium speakers is Miriam Murad, a professor in cancer immunology and the director of the Precision Immunology Institute at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Nikki Spaj from the Scientist Creative Services team spoke with Murad about her research investigating how antigen-presenting cells enhance anti-tumor immune responses and her recent advocacy work fighting against the Foreign Scholar Visa Ban. The cancer immunology field is exploding, with T-cell therapies showing immense promise. Unfortunately, only a subset of cancer patients respond to these therapies. So researchers are exploring other facets of the immune system and its effect on cancer progression to look for alternative treatments. Miriam Murad initially trained as an oncologist, attending medical school at the University of Algiers. During her medical residency, she became interested in the immune system and its connection to cancer. She now studies myeloid cells, a group of innate immune cells that include antigen-presenting dendritic cells and macrophages. These cells sense and respond to tissue injury and play a role in activating cancer-fighting T-cells. T-cells cannot recognize a tumor antigen by itself. It has to be educated to recognize and kill or to recognize and react against any type of tumor antigen. It was very clear since I started to understand the immune system that the cells I wanted to study and manipulate were this compartment of antigen-presenting cells. Macrophage role is to constantly sense a danger and they respond to a danger by recruiting effector cells. So for example, T cells or NK cells or neutrophil. Macrophage also have an important property, which is to clear a damage. These sometimes include really reducing inflammation or reducing an immune response against the danger. This is the main property of a macrophage in cancer, is to really reduce tumor immunity. And the cancer lesions really fool macrophages in that they think that what they have is quite things down because there is a chronic injury that cannot heal. They end up playing a very strong immunosuppressive role that really reduces T-cell ability to kill tumor cells. Dendritic cells are essential to mount a very strong anti-tumor T-cell response. There is a specific dendritic cell subset that excel in educating tumor-specific T-cell immunity. And these dendritic cells clearly are strongly reduced in cancer lesions. A lot of focus of my lab has been to see how we can restore these dendritic cells compartment and how we can also understand better how it behaves in the tumor lesions. Through her research, Murad aims to better understand antigen-presenting cells, or APCs, and find ways to restore their presence and immune function in the tumor microenvironment. By manipulating certain APC pathways that have pro-tumor effects in some cancers, the cells can become more effective anti-tumor agents that prolong T-cell survival, enhance T-cell activation, and reduce tissue immunosuppression. Murad uses single-cell mapping of the tumor microenvironment from human cancer tissues to learn about the organization of tumor lesions and the cellular programs of cells in that compartment. Now with single cell technology, because we can capture so many parameters, we can uh, extract a lot of information even from very small tumor lesions. And that type of knowledge is uh, now allowing us to understand uh, how these immune cells are really organized uh, and potentially how they are contributing uh, to promoting cancer growth or reducing cancer growth. Murad's team previously studied cancer primarily in mouse models and tried to extrapolate mouse cancer data to humans. Now, thanks to the data obtained from human samples, she can refine her mouse cancer models to focus on the cell programs that humans and mice have in common. Recently, Murad's group discovered an important dendritic cell class in both human and mouse non-small lung cancer tissue sites that affects cancer progression. 
We had identified a program in dendritic cell that we thought was really induced upon migration of dendritic cell to the draining lymph node. And using single cell sequencing, what we found is that this program was not only present in the lymph node. We saw that some of these cells were also present at the tissue side. So we started to understand how this program was, was induced. And what we saw is that that program was induced upon uptake of tumor antigen. And then this has completely transformed the way we are targeting this program. Upon tumor antigen uptake, these dendritic cells activate a pathway that reduces their functionality. When the researchers blocked this pro-tumor cellular program, the pool of tumor-infiltrating effector T cells increased and the tumor burden reduced. Murad's research could lead to new therapeutics that downregulate cancer-promoting cell pathways or enhance anti-tumor effects in immune cells. Recently, Murad has been using her platform as a respected scientist to advocate for better science policy. On June 22, 2020, the United States government instituted a visa ban that blocks the entry of foreign scholars into the country. The stated purpose of this ban is to help the American workforce recover during the global COVID-19 pandemic. Murad firmly disagrees that non-immigrant scientists put the workforce at risk and believes that the ban will do irreparable harm to American academic institutions and the pharmaceutical and biotech industries. The reason why academic labs are more innovative than the private sector is attributed to academia much higher access to a young, dynamic and bright workforce. Now, research in academic lab is being done by students, postdoc and technicians. The large majority of postdocs and technicians are by far foreigners. Now, postdoctoral fellows, which we also call junior scientists, are uh, recruited quite competitively from all over the world. And they have been fully trained in their country at no cost to the American payer. And, and these people are going to decide to leave their country and family to spend few years completely immersed in research, which is you know, a testament to their dedication. Now, this group of scientists constitutes a major asset to U.S. lab. They form really the research core of most laboratory, and it is because of these junior scientists that we can compete internationally. And it is because of our ability to attract all these bright scientists from all over the world and unleash their ambition and motivation that U.S. has been able to reach such a prominent place in science. According to Murad, rather than increasing American employment, the visa ban will make it difficult to fill postdoctoral fellowship positions. This will transfer much of the lab work to graduate students who are in the midst of their training, placing the burden of data generation on less skilled individuals and prolonging the time it takes to obtain results. This shift may cause the United States to lose its position as a leader in the scientific arena. Not too long ago, it's important to realize that the most popular countries for scientists were not located in in North America. They were in Europe. They included Germany, France, and England. America didn't obtain the prominent place it holds in science overnight. It took a lot of investment, a lot of vision to be where we are. And at the center of this vision is the decision to welcome scientists from all over the world and and empower them to contribute to the U.S. scientific force. And it is because of our sending in science that we can attract the brightest scientists to our laboratory. And it is because they come here that we can remain competitive. So being competitive means being able to make progress, scientific progress, being able to find new cures to treatment, being able to generate patent, being able to generate new companies. So as soon as we'll make it difficult or uncertain for foreign scientists to stay here, they will just go somewhere else. This visa restriction is incentivizing our competitors to recruit foreign scientists. Foreign scientists, especially the brightest one, will not risk their career by going to a place that has shady immigration policies. The empty slot created by the ban will not lead to increased American employment. On the contrary, the slots will remain empty and it will have an adversary impact on scientific research. There is an exception to the ban for scientists working on COVID-19. While that is helpful for our current situation, Murad argues that institutions in the United States need skilled foreign researchers to look ahead and work on problems that arise in the future. No one was working on COVID before COVID happened. 
However, we were able to quickly redeploy our research force to address this new disease. To be able to compete in science or in medicine, you need to be prepared. And we cannot anticipate what would be the biggest medical threat of tomorrow. What we need to do is to continue to invest in research and therefore to continue to recruit the brightest mind to the U.S. And this is how you can beat the next pandemic. For better or for worse, scientists often don't involve themselves in politics. Murad feels that it's time to change that. Along with several colleagues, she wrote an open letter that emphasizes the impact of the ban on the future of science. In less than two days, the letter collected 3,000 signatures. It was signed by people across the political spectrum, trainees, Nobel Prize winners, and heads of academic institutions, hospitals, and biotech companies. This letter will soon be published in the journal Cell, along with an article summarizing the impact of the ban on the American scientific community. Her co-authors include her former PhD student, Andrew Leder, her colleague, Brian Brown, and biomedical scientist Jan Vilcek, who, after immigrating to the United States from communist Czechoslovakia, made essential contributions to anti-inflammatory drug development. This is the first time Murad has become so vocal about a political issue. However, she feels that it's time for other scientists to also mobilize and engage the public and the government about important science issues. So we need to carefully pay attention and oppose vocally government policy that may endanger our scientific endeavor. We need to write to governors, we need to write to the press, we need to denounce and oppose this policy in the scientific press, but also in the lay press. And we need also to encourage trainees, and especially American trainees, to engage in this fight. They need to raise their voices if they want to inherit the same vibrant community than the one we, their mentors, inherited. And finally, we need to have more scientists in office to come up with data-driven policy. Because the future of humanity is science. You know, the reason why Americans are living longer is because we discovered penicillin and antibiotics, because we understood, you know, the, the hygiene measures that were able to, to reduce infection spread. Science has transformed the way we live. Our standing in science will not remain if we do not understand the history of what brought us where we are. Thank you for listening to The Scientist Lab Talk. This episode was produced by the Creative Services team for The Scientist and narrated by Nikki Spodge. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to our podcast channels, The Scientist Speaks and Lab Talk, wherever you get your podcasts.